Good afternoon again, everyone. Welcome. Um, this is the next lecture in the series of videos on introduction to proofs. Uh, we're about to start a new unit, a uh, unit four on mathematical induction. So um, this is the last main proof technique that we haven't yet talked about. Um, it's very important when you're trying to prove statements about um, all positive integers. And before we get to that, as customary, almost every single time we have to start with a bunch of definitions, informal definitions this time. And we're going to switch out from, you know, we've been talking about set theory a lot. Now we're going to do more number theoretic stuff, things that involve integers and arithmetic and so on. And these definitions um, relate to that. So first, let's talk about factorials. Actually, you've probably seen some of this in calculus or elsewhere, but, but let's just take a look. So n factorial, n with an exclamation point, is we're going to say it's going to be 1 times 2 times 3 times dot, dot, dot times n, the product of the first n positive integers. There's one definition. Next definition, um, summations. If you wanted to add up a bunch of, of terms, you could use this, this summation symbol, uh, sum k equals 1 to n of a k, where a sub k is, for each k, is like a real number or and something like that. And, but what this symbol means is you're supposed to add them all up. a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot, 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 plus a n. That is what this summation symbol is supposed to mean. All right, and I think you've probably seen that somewhere in when you did Taylor series or something in calculus. Something you may not have seen, but which is quite similar, is products. If you wanted to multiply a whole bunch of terms together, uh, this sigma, this is the capital Greek letter sigma, and we're going to use the capital pi for product to indicate a product. So here we've got the product, k goes from 1 to n of a k, that's the new symbol being defined, and, and what you do is you just take the product, a1 times a2 times a3, dot, 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 times a n. All right, one more definition, which I'm certain you've seen in algebra, which is exponent notation. If you want to take, you have some real number x, say, uh, and you want x to the n, well, by definition, that means x times x times x times x times x, dot, 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 where there are n copies of x. For, say, n, let's say n is positive here. And then you have to do something else for negative, but let's not worry about that yet. Okay. So we've got these definitions. Or do we? All right. So I've labeled them informal definitions. And there's actually a subtlety with these definitions that, that is problematic. And they aren't real definitions after all, as it turns out. Because in each case, if you will notice, I had to use in my definition the dot, dot, dot symbol, which there's a fancy name for that that's called an ellipsis in typography, three dots. And what that means is that I've left stuff out in the middle in each of these formulas. And you're just supposed to know, based on the pattern, you know, what goes there. Like all these, all the integers I didn't list are, are supposed to be there, and all the terms I didn't list are supposed to be there, and there's more x's there, because that's what the pattern is. All right, but in an actual formal treatment of mathematics, you, you can't really do that. You can't just sort of leave stuff out and hope that the reader is going to figure out what you meant. Okay. 
So none of these definitions are actually truly definitions in the formal sense. We have to do something else. Okay, you say, well, what else are we going to do? Like, how are we going to do it? And the answer is, in each case, it's going to be possible to define the concepts that we, we have here in a different way, which is called a recursive definition. And this is a new idea, at least in this course. We haven't seen this yet. We're going to see it a lot starting now. So let's start to write some of these down. I'll just illustrate with examples, and, and, and you'll see quickly what, what these things mean. All right, so let me redefine factorials in a recursive way. And this is like the official definition that you're going to actually memorize. I'll redefine all of these factorials first. And the idea is that uh, I'll give you a, a basic definition first that's called the base case for a small choice of n. I'll say something like define one factorial is equal to 1. All right, that's called the base case of the definition. That's fine, right? But then when I get to all higher integers than 1, I won't just say the value. I'll give what's called a recursive formula. So for all n, at least 1, positive integers n, only for integers here, I'll say that n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n factorial by definition. And this is called the recursive clause or, or portion of the definition. All right, and there's something very unusual here that hasn't ever happened before. In all our definitions before, we had the defined term, the new term we never used before, you know, new notation on one side of the definition, and then on the other side we had stuff that didn't have the new symbol in it, with the definition text is what we called that. Whereas here, I'm defining factorial, and there's also a factorial over there. Okay, so that's, that's what recursive means. You're defining a concept in terms of sort of earlier copies of itself which seems kind of fishy when you at, at first until you realize, well, it's not the same one. And the idea is, okay, for instance, like, like what if n equals 1 as an example? This is true for all n. So if n equals 1, here, if you put 1 in everywhere, you discover that 2 factorial, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 factorial is 2 times 1 factorial. And I already know that 1 factorial is 1. So then that, now I've discovered that 2 factorial is 2. And then once you know that, well, then you could, you could go over here and let n equal 2 in this expression. 2 plus 1 is 3. So, so then you see that 3 factorial is 3 times 2 factorial, which and we already know 2 factorial. And so now 3 times 2 is 6. So, so 3 factorial is now 6. And the idea is you're going to progress up the integers in order if you need to. Uh, for instance, but here's another way of thinking. So let's suppose maybe we need to know 5 factorial. If that's the thing we want for whatever reason. You'd have to go up here and, and say, okay, to get 5, I need n to be 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. And then 5 factorial would be, would be 5 times 4 factorial. This is a separate example. And you say, okay, I don't know that yet, so I have to go here. And you just sort of you keep going down. And iterating. All right, so we already got three factorial, but just to show you to, to make contact with this, you could just keep going all the way down. And eventually you hit the base case. One factorial is one, and then you get this product, and, and you can do it and figure out what it is. All right, so it's not like there's circularity or whatever, uh, you, but you just have to work your way either up or down, however you want to think about it, and the recursive definition um, provides you with what you need. So that's what you do here, and the same thing will work on these other ones. 
So let me give you now recursive definitions of summations and products and exponents. This is section 4.1 of the book, if you're reading that book. All right, just like every other definition, you're going to have to memorize it perfectly because uh, we're going to use these things in proofs. And we'll see how that works. So recursive definition of sums. And here I'm assuming we've got um, a bunch of numbers, say real numbers, which I'm calling a sub k. All right, and so, so every recursive definition is going to have these two pieces, the base case and a recursive part. And the base case for a sum is sum k equals 1 to 1 of a k, which is basically just one term. You're starting and stopping at 1, so that that sum is just a 1. You're not even really summing anything. And for the recursive part, um, actually, let me just make sure I have enough room here. I always mean integers, but for brevity, I, I won't always use the z. But for all positive integers, um, what's the sum? k goes from 1 to n plus 1 of a k. Well, so I'm trying to add up n plus 1 things, a1 through a n plus 1. Um, one way I could do that is to say first, add up the first n things, recursively using this same summation, but now ending at n, okay, which takes me up to a n, and then I have to add in the last term. And there's our recursive definition of a sum, okay. Um, Again, if you think informally with the ellipses, notice these, these new recursive definitions don't use the dot, 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 so we've gotten rid of that problem. Uh, but it does expand into what you think, at least intuitively. Uh, same for products. Products. Again, this is the one maybe you're not as familiar with this notation, but it works the same way. If I take the product, k goes from 1 to 1 of a k, well, that's just a1 base case there. And then for longer products, for every n positive integer n at least 1, if you want the product k going from 1 to n plus 1 of a k, that's defined recursively to be the product k goes from 1 to n of a k. So a1 times a2 times dot, 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 times a n, informally, ending at n. And then you need this last term. So but now you multiply it instead of adding it. That's the only difference. Of course, the different symbol, too. All right, and um, exponents. Exponent notation, if you want. And here we're going to fix uh, an x, a real x, at the beginning here. And, OK, so the base case in these have started at 1, all right, but they can actually start in other places as well. So for the exponent notation, I'll use a base case of 0. So x to the 0 is defined to be 1, so that's a base case. And um, then for all integers n greater than or equal to 0, instead of 1, um, I'll tell you how to get x to the n plus 1 in terms of x to the n. And the definition, the recursive definition, is the x to the n plus 1 is x to the n times one more copy of x. Hopefully that's not a huge surprise. Uh, in any case, and, and let's just see an expansion of this uh, to make sure we all get that. So, for example, going from sort of from the top down, or 
starting with, say, x cubed, if you want to know what x cubed is, from the definition, you have to take n equal 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. So x cubed is x squared times x. But then I know what x squared is, so I have to go here. And so, so take n equals 1 now. x squared is x to the 1 times x. And just put that into the, the previous formula. And well, what's x to the 1? Well, it's here x to the 1 is x to the 0 times x. So I put that in to substitute it in. And then finally, I know x to the 0. x to the 0 is 1, so that goes away. And of course, 1 times anything is 1. And so we do indeed get a, the product of three copies of x, um, as you expected from the original definition. And again, for any particular integer like 3, we could have just done that. But for, to have a definition that works for all integers and does not use ellipsis and doesn't leave stuff out, well, you basically have to do something like this. All right. Oh, yeah, so factorial is just for convenience. I did this. There's actually 0 factorial, which is also equal to 1 by definition. That, so the base case there could have been 0 as well. Uh, but, but I didn't want to bug you with that right at the beginning. So anyway. All right, so uh, another thing to memorize, the, the two pieces of each recursive definition uh, have to be carefully memorized. So you should be doing that now while I erase stuff, uh, because that's what we're going to use to prove things about factorials and sums and products and, and exponents and so on. All right. And that's the next thing to worry about is how we're going to do a proof if, if there's a recursive definition appearing in the proof or some concept that's defined recursively. And the theme of the next few lectures is that very thing, that every time you have a recursively defined concept requiring a proof, you're going to need this new proof technique called proofs by induction. Well, almost all the time. Let's say every time. And again, this is the last new thing, new type of proof we've never seen before, although it doesn't actually come completely out of the blue. It's going to use ingredients we've talked about before, like proving if statements and so on. But actually, before we get there, uh, we need a new axiom. I'll call it the induction axiom. Hopefully all these colors are visible. We'll find out after it's too late if they're not. Uh, anyway, but I'll write the, the axiom itself with white chalk. My, it's hard to tell in my video, little thumbnail there, what's actually visible. Um, Anyway, so this is a statement about positive integers. And it's, it's, gonna, it's a very general statement that, about, that involves open sentences, P of n. So P of n, you think of it as some statement about a positive integer n that, that you're trying to prove, maybe, or that you're interested in. Um, and for each n, n that you put in, you get a different statement that might be true or false. And, and what you're usually trying to do is to prove that this thing is true for every positive integer. So let me write that statement now and call it A. So for every n in the positive integers, P of n. That's going to, in most of our proofs, this, the things we're proving will be things that look like this. Universal statements about all positive integers. And what this axiom says is that no matter what this statement is, this statement A with the quantifier is equivalent to, has the same truth value as statement B. Here's statement B. P of 1 And for all positive integers n, if p of n is true, then p of n plus 1 is true. 
this whole thing is statement B. And the axiom itself is saying that this simple looking universal statement is equivalent to this complicated thing. Okay. And, and what we're going to eventually do is prove things like this by instead proving this complicated thing, which might seem like a ridiculous, why do something complicated when you do something simple? Okay. But it's going to turn out, as we'll see very shortly, that the complicated thing is much, much easier to prove um, than the original thing, for reasons we'll come to. But first, before we get to any of that, let's just stop for a second and try to absorb this axiom. Uh, just like definitions, um, when a new axiom comes along, you're obligated to memorize it, but you are not obligated to prove it. Uh, the axioms do not require proof. They're supposed to be these initial statements that we accept without proof. But that seems maybe a little unfair in this case when the thing that's being stated, this equivalence here, just seems so weird. And it's like, why, why, is those, why are those two things the same? Right. So in fact, although no proof is required, I will attempt to give you an informal explanation or an intuitive explanation. of the axiom. Like, why should we even believe it? And the first comment, which I'll basically leave as a little optional exercise for everybody, is that you can actually prove very easily from stuff we've already talked about that statement A implies statement B without even needing an axiom. You can just prove that right out. Don't need anything new for that. But that's not the direction we actually care about so much. What we really want to know, and what the axiom is telling us, is why does B imply A? If we knew B, why would we then believe that A is true? Which is the exact thing we're going to use in all these proofs. Okay. And well, let's see. Okay. So B, if, assuming B was true, we're going to get a lot of information. So given the truth of B, we can deduce a lot of information. I'll be more specific. B is an AND statement, so both separate things are true. In particular, P of 1 is true, if given that this statement here is true. And on the other hand, this universal statement about all n, the other part of the n, that's also true. Okay. And as you recall from before, the inference rule for all, the definition of all, means I can substitute positive integers in here and get lots and lots and lots of true if statements out of this known universal statement. So let's do that. For instance, if I let n equals 1, which is a positive integer, I see from statement B that if P of 1 is true, then P of 2 is true. And I'm just saying is true for emphasis. That's, that's what I mean when you have an open sentence here. Um, that's, so that's part of what, what is being said. Now I could let n equal 2 get even more information. And I see that if P of 2 is true, then p of 3 is true. When n equals 2 right there, and I have no reason to stop there. If, if I let n equal 3 in the known universal statement, I, I can say that as something else I know is if p of 3 is true, then p of 4 is true. Now I'll do one more, and so I'm going to say, you can just keep going, obviously. P of 4 is true, then P of 5 is true. Dot, dot, dot. So, or you could say, and so on. Maybe that's going to make you a little bit suspicious here. But anyway, you get infinite amount of information 
locked in this universal that you can start writing out. You can write out part of it anyway. And let's think about what else we could get. Because remember, we also had this thing called the inference rule for if, which said, for instance, that if you know this, if you know p of 1 is true, and that's the hypothesis of an if statement, like this one that's already known, we know all these things from statement b. Well, then, by combining these two things, by the inference rule for if, we get that, um, or we deduce, that p of 2 is true. Not just this conditional, but because the hypothesis worked, then the conclusion is true on its own. All right? But then once that happens, I can use that known information with this known if then in, in item 3. If p of 2 is true, which it is, then p of 3 is true as another deduction. And then that's just what we need to use this one, which means p of 4 is true. And then we deduce p of 5. And so on. Dot, dot, dot. All right. And, but what you see, if you believe this pattern, is that now, by going cascading all the way down, we've actually managed to show p of n for every positive. We're eventually going to get to any positive integer by doing this process. And so we've proved a. Therefore, assumed B, we've proved A, we've, we've shown. And you might say, well, well, then why is there an axiom? Didn't we just prove it? Okay. And the trouble, of course, is the same trouble with the, from the beginning, which is the dot, dot, dot. In other words, you're, to actually prove it, you'd have to write infinitely many if statements down here. You have to write infinitely many deductions over here. And one of the logic things is that all proofs must be finitely long. And so you, although this should be very compelling, evidence, and you should hopefully believe now that that's why this statement gives you this one. For logical purposes, you need an axiom to, to get rid of the infinite character of the, of the deduction chain. And another way to think about it, like, so you have to worry, well, what if there's some integer that's so big like that you never get there like from all this stuff, right? And, and this axiom, another way of thinking about it is it's sort of characterizing and saying, well, actually, uh, by this very definition, this very axiom, these are the things you get by starting with one and adding one repeatedly over and over and over again is exactly what the set of positive integers is. Okay. But however you choose to think about it, whether you're intuition or whatever, the main point is that these two statements are equivalent from now on, thanks to the axiom. I guess I'll draw the obligatory picture that you always see, the domino picture, just as one little extra bit of intuition. So this little thing is supposed to be like a domino standing on its edge. And at, at each positive integer, there's a domino standing straight up. I assume you've all seen the, um, was it, Big Bang Theory episode where they have the, all the dominoes on the floor and stuff. That was a really good one, in my opinion. Dot, 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 dot. All right, and what we're saying, and basically here's a way to think about it, is you're trying to prove that all the dominoes are going to fall down. Um, there's a domino for every positive integer. And what we're saying is to do that, it suffices to know two things. First, if the first domino does fall down, which is like p of 1 being true, so suppose you prove that, right? And the other thing you have to prove is that for any particular domino, any fixed domino out somewhere, in anywhere, if this domino falls down, then that's going to force the next one to fall down. All right, that's some visual intuition for what this means. And then you're supposed to believe that those two pieces of information are going to force all the dominoes to fall down, right? Uh, because if this one falls, then what would I just said here with n equals 1? Then this one falls, then this one falls, this one, this one, this one. And the, you can't, of course, draw the ends, the infinite, the whole thing. Uh, but the whole the idea is that you're actually going to reach all the positive integers eventually. They're all going to fall down by by this two-step cascade process. All right. 
Now, obviously, this doesn't have any mathematical weight to it. It's just a picture that's trying to help you with the intuition for what's happening. All right. So really here, even if this looks like math, it's, it isn't a substitute for this axiom. So you need the axiom to actually do it. So let's leave the axiom up for a moment. All right, and now we're ready for the proof technique, the induction proof method. It's very important. You'll use it all over the place. I have to make sure I keep this guy. And so let's call this um, ordinary induction proofs. And again, the goal in, in for, from now on for lots of things we're doing will be to prove a universal statement expressing some property of all positive integers. And we're gonna we're about to build a template to do that based on this idea that we've just discussed from, from this axiom that in order to prove this. Well, we can, it's just as good to prove this logically equivalent statement which is guaranteed to have the same truth value, which is that. Okay. And so, um, well, we already know how to prove that. So you could, I could have said just make a proof outline for this thing based on and and if and for all. And we're, we're about to do that, and that will just magically create the proof template for an ordinary induction proof, pretty much. And the one thing I, I'm going to add to that is just so everybody knows, so you don't have to keep referring to the axiom or copying the axiom down every time. You don't generally do that. You just say at the beginning of your proof, we use induction on n. Okay? And that's basically an abbreviation for the fact that you, you've got these two statements. You're going to write this second statement every time. Um, this second statement is an and. Okay, we're trying to prove it now. That is, we're going to prove B, and that's that's good enough to prove A. How do you prove an and? If there's a two-part proof, right? Part one. Prove the first part, which is a just P of one, which is a single statement where you've replaced n by one, a particular statement about the integer one. Um, that's what you do. That's usually very easy. Okay, and then for part two. You've got to prove the other path, part of the hand, okay? Which is this longer thing, but we still we know how to do that. It's a universal statement, um, so we're going to follow the rule for that. Um, I'll, I'll label it in the little pieces here. A, so we have to fix an arbitrary integer, positive integer, n uh, naught, say constant n naught. It's greater than or equal to one for this particular version. There's other, you can start at zero and stuff, we'll get to that later, but here we'll start at one. Arbitrary integer, then we've got to prove this if statement over here. So what, I'll, I'll just say it down here for a second. Prove P of N naught implies P of N naught plus one. That's what I'm about to do right here, just using direct proof. Okay, how do you prove an if statement? Well, you assume that, prove that. So assume P of n naught, I'll just, is true, again, for emphasis, you don't have to say that. Assume P of n naught is true. Prove P of n naught plus 1 is true. And that is the entire template, the entire proof structural outline. That's what you did. All right, and there's some special terminology that, that gets used a lot for these, these proofs that might sound like the recursion, the recursive definition stuff we're talking about. Uh, and part one is often called the base case of the induction proof. And part two 
is often called the induction um, step of the proof, where you're going from uh, one value of n, p of n naught, you're assuming that one and, and, and proving the next one. This, this assumption that you make in the induction step is called the induction hypothesis. And, and now um, we're actually in a position to see why exactly it's easier. Okay, Because something else you could have done is this what we did before we did induction. If I asked you to prove A without this new stuff, you would just say, fix an arbitrary positive integer n, n naught, whatever, prove p of n naught. Okay? Which is kind of like what's happening here. But look, in the induction proof, you actually get to assume something to help you prove it. Whereas without induction, you wouldn't get to assume anything, other than the fact that n was a positive integer. And that could be very difficult, whereas now you've got some closely related statement as known information for the induction step that's going to help you presumably get to the next statement. Another thing that's, that trips people up sometimes, they say, oh my god, you know, it's, it's circular reasoning. We're assuming the same thing that we're proving, and that's not allowed. That's illogical. But that's not, a, not, that's not what's happening at all, right? And that's why this is crucial. Uh, during this step, uh, n naught is constant. It's not the variable. It's all positive integers. We're only assuming p of n naught for one particular fixed, though unspecified, integer, positive integer. And then we're using that to help us prove the next instance of the thing we're proving, which is a different statement, because it has a different parameter. So that's not circular at all. Um, but of course, it's crucial that we fit, we can't omit the fixing step, um, which comes from this quantifier right here. All right, so um, those are the main comments I wanted to make about induction proof. And based on the, yeah, so this is a good time to stop. And for the second part of the video, we will do some examples of induction proofs using those recursive definitions that we already had. So we'll continue that with the next segment.